Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webcast on cash flow matching, balancing short term needs with long term investing. My name is Hank Kim, and I'm the executive director of NC PERS. Today's program is part of our expanded Center for Online Learning. As we all adjust to the new COVID reality, please bear with us if there should be any, te any technical issues or unplanned background noise during our session. As always, your patience and understanding is appreciated. We encourage audience participation. Please submit questions by using the GoToWebinar portal. However, to ensure that we can cover all our topics today, we will hold your questions till the last part of the program. Today's webcast is sponsored by Goldman Sachs Asset Management. To introduce their firm in today's webcast, we have with us Michael Gousse and uh, Michael Moran. Michael Gousse is a Senior Fixed Income Portfolio Manager and co-head of the Global Pension Solutions effort. He focuses on liability-driven investments and multi-sector fixed income strategies and has more than 20 years of investment experience. Michael Moran is a pension strategist at Goldman Sachs Asset Management, where he produces original research and thought leadership on issues pertaining to defined benefit plans. In this role, he advises clients on a wide range of topics related to asset allocation, pension risk management, and the impact of regulatory and financial reporting changes. Guys, at this point, I'll turn over the webinar to you. Thank you, Hank. And uh, thank you, everyone, for having us here today. We're excited to be with you. And just wanted to do a quick reminder uh, that the, the webcast is not intended for the media. Uh, Goldman Sachs Asset Management is one of the world's leading investment managers. Uh, we have over 2,000 professionals across 38 different offices worldwide, providing institutional and individual investors with investment and advisory solutions with uh, strategy spanning asset classes, industries, and geographies. Our investment solutions include fixed income, money market, public and private equity, commodities, hedge funds, and real estate. Our clients access these solutions through proprietary strategies, strategic partnership, and our open architecture program. Our investment teams represent over 700 investment professionals, capitalizing on market insights, risk management expertise, and the technology of Goldman Sachs. We help navigate clients uh, through today's dynamic markets and identify opportunities that shape their portfolios and long-term investment goals. We expand the, extend these uh, capabilities to the world leading pension plans, sovereign wealth funds, central banks, insurance companies, financial institutions, endowments, foundations, individuals, and family offices for whom we invest and advise more than $1 trillion of assets. So thanks again, let me get that out of the way. And um, you know, we're excited to be here to discuss what we think is um, one of the, the future uh, opportunities for the fixed income component of many pension plans. And with that, I'll hand to Mike to uh, start us off, and then we'll get into the weeds a little bit more. Great. Thanks, Mike. And good afternoon. Good morning to everyone. We hope everyone is, is safe and well. You know, as we say in that, the headline to the presentation today, you know, for, for many pension plans, the challenge is balancing short-term needs while at the same time being a long-term investor. So we're going to get into a little bit about how we think about cash flow matching, and Mike, in a, in a few minutes, will get into that sort of the details of those portfolios. But we figured to start, let's just kind of lay the groundwork a little bit about why we think a cash flow matching strategy may be important for a pension plan today. So with that, I'm gonna ask if we can flip to the fourth slide in the presentation, just to go over a little bit of what the agenda will look like. And there's a couple of realities that I'd say we, we have to keep in mind. There's one reality that is many defined benefit pension systems are very mature, right? They've been around for decades, their participants are aging, more of them are moving into retirement status. And as a result, outflows for benefit payments are increasing. And again, this is for many defined benefit pension systems around the world, not just US public pension systems. So there's these cash flow challenges. On top of that, we know that we're probably in for a period in the future where returns across different asset classes may be lower than what we've historically experienced. And certainly a lot of that is tied to where interest rates are here in the United States today and where they are likely to remain over a longer period of time. So you take that challenge of near-term liquidity needs 
for benefit payments that will likely only increase as, again, more baby boomers retire and, and these plans continue to mature with trying to be a long-term investor and, and how do I get returns in a, in a low return, likely be a low return environment. And then, therefore, we don't view cash flow matching as a panacea, so to speak, but it can be an important tool in the toolbox that plan sponsors may want to consider as they think about their strategy going forward. Now, if we turn to slide five, we leverage a lot of the data at the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College. I'm sure many on this webinar are familiar with this group. And what we did, as you can see on the slide, is over the last over 10 years, kind of looked at public pension plans and evaluated what their benefit payments were in relation to their contributions. And this is what we refer to as their net cash flow status. And as you can see on the slide, for this entire 10 plus years, um, the system has been net cash flow negative. In other words, outflows for benefit payments exceeding contributions coming in from sponsors and participants. And in particular, in the last several years, it has remained elevated around the 90% level. Now, before I go any further, I'd like everyone to take a look at slide six. Because I think whenever we hear the term negative, and I'll ask you to go to slide six, please. Um, whenever we hear the term negative, right, we think about bad things, right? Negative connotates bad. We're negative cash flow as a system. Many plans are, are negative cash flow. And certainly there may be some cases where being in a negative cash flow position is a, maybe a, a, a indicator of breath on the system, in particular if the sponsor maybe is struggling to make contributions. But as we outline on slide six, it doesn't necessarily mean that a plan is, is in a stressed situation. It just means there may be certain implications that we have to take into account as we think about our investment strategy and our asset allocation. In particular, as we say right at the top of slide six, the assets, remember, are there to pay benefit payments. That's what they're intended to do. The assets that we accumulate in public pension systems are there for the beneficiaries who have earned their pensions after a lifetime of work. This is the natural end game for assets, is to end up in the hands of participants, and that's a wonderful thing. Obviously, then it go, of course, so as we think about how those outflows increase, that is going to be an implication we'll have to take into account. As we see on the middle of slide six, let's also keep in mind that for well-funded plans or even overfunded plans, they will naturally be cash flow negative. If we're in a well-funded position, maybe we're not making as many contributions as we would have if we were underfunded. That's actually a very good indicator. So just being cash flow negative isn't necessarily an indicator of plan stress but it does have several implications that we do think will tie into asset allocation, investment strategy, and that's where we're gonna get into cash flow matching in a few minutes. Now, if we look at slide seven, I'm always hesitant to look at one year's worth of data because as we all know, in one year's worth of data, that things can jump around, we can have outliers. But as I mentioned in the, in the previous slide, when we looked at that long history of net, negative net cash flow, for 2019, 90% of the plans in the public universe were negative cash flow. And what you see on slide seven is we've just kind of graphed that out. On the y-axis, we've shown their contributions as a percentage of assets. And on the x-axis, what those benefit payments were. And obviously, then if you're below the line, you're net cash flow negative. If you're above the line, you're net cash flow positive. And yes, since 90% of the plans, as we showed earlier, are negative net cash flow in 2019, Obviously, many of them, or most of them, are below the line. But the other thing to look at this exhibit is on that x-axis, what that percentage of benefit payments, uh, uh, benefit payments as a percentage of plan assets, for many plans, that number is 10% or higher, which is a pretty large drawdown in assets. And if you think about that also, if we go to slide eight, if you think about that on a net basis, if we take those contributions and benefit payments and put them together on a net basis, you can see at the distribution, again, those two bars at the far right, those are our cash flow positive plans, about 10%. But the bars on the left side of your screen are the net cash flow negative. You can see most of the observations fall in about a negative net cash flow of about 2 to 4% of the beginning of your assets, which again, when you compound that year after year after year, has a drain on assets that has implications for our investment strategy. I would also point out on slide eight here, if you look at the far left side, you can see we have over 10% of the plans where the net cash flow was 4% or higher. And that's where you really start to see a drawdown in assets because of these outflows and what that could mean for uh, you know, the, the drawdown in assets and the liquidity needs of a plan sponsor. If you look at the next slide, slide nine, 
that takes those same numbers, but now looks at it on a dollar basis. And again, the far right, 10% of the plans cash flow positive. Most of the plans you can see there that sort of a couple hundred million dollars cash flow negative, which again, if it recurs year after year, um, can have a sort of compounding effect on the drawdown in assets. But then again, if you look at the far left there, 16% of the plans in the universe, over a billion dollars uh, net cash flow negative. Again, a one year period, that may not mean it's persistent year to year, but we certainly know that benefit payments tend to be pretty pers persistent year to year, if not increasing. Um, and if contributions are following suit, what you see on this slide is indicative of sort of that asset drawdown that you may see every year. Now, if you turn to slide 10, please, what are the sort of implications of this for plan sponsors? And we think there are a couple that we'd wanna highlight. At the top there, one of the things we just point out, and this is basically just math, right? If you are an underfunded plan and you pay out benefit payments, unless for the, the interest of simplicity, we assume there's no contributions in a given year, and when we pay out benefit payments, our assets and liabilities decline by the same amount. So if you look at, and under the first section there on slide 10, we have a plan that has $900 of assets, $1,000 of liabilities, they're $100 underfunded, they have a 90% funded status. When they pay out $100 in benefit payments, assets and liabilities come down by the same amount. Our dollar deficit is unchanged. We're still $100 underfunded, but our funded percentage has fallen because the base of assets and liabilities have fallen. Same thing in the second section on this, on this slide. Again, same example, $900 of assets, $1,000 of liabilities. We have a $100 deficit which if we exclude contributions would require an 11.1% asset return in order to cure that deficit, to make up that $100, uh, $100 deficit. Once we pay out those benefit payments, we still have a $100 deficit, but because our asset base has shrunk, we now need a 12.5% return to make up that deficit. So those remaining assets really have to work harder as those benefit payments kind of draw down that asset base. So when we think about how plans potentially have responded to this, if we look at slide 11, please, we certainly know that over a longer period of time, there has been a very substantial move by public pension plans to alternative asset classes, in particular private assets. We've just taken here, again, leveraging data from the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College, looking at aggregate asset allocation from 2005 to 2019. We can see a couple of trends here. Number one, public equity has come down. But fixed income has come down as well. And where are those assets gone? They've gone particularly to alternatives, private equity, real estate, hedge funds. We don't have a breakout of that fixed income category within these pie charts, but certainly the move to private debt has been a, a substantial move by a number of institutional investors, including public pension plans. And yet, despite all these moves to more illiquid asset classes, as you can see at the bottom there, the average expected return on asset assumption for these plans has actually dropped from 2005 to 2019. And so certainly when we think about a, a situation where plans have more liquidity needs because their assets are being drained down by, by benefit payments, on top of them potentially looking for more return, well, this move to alternatives, this move to private assets probably continues even more than what we've seen in the last number of years. And this is when we get into sort of, in a second, the cash flow matching strategy how potentially having more certainty on our short-term needs, our benefit payments, our liquidity needs, may allow plan sponsors to take even more in liquidity risk. Public pension systems are, by definition, some of the most obvious long-term investors given the length of their liabilities. Potentially having a cash flow matching strategy could provide them more certainty on near-term liquidity needs that will allow them to even be even more long-term investors in particular, again, you can see the return assumption for these portfolios having gone down despite a move to alternatives. When we look even farther forward on slide 12, slide 12 shows data that we get from Horizon Actuarial Services, um, which does a survey of expected returns. Certainly as an asset management organization, we have uh, groups that come up with different return assumptions for different asset classes. We're happy to share those with anyone who's interested to see them. But as someone who does sort of research work, I'm also interested in what does the rest of the market think? And I've always enjoyed this survey because they compile return assumptions across different asset classes from different, different asset managers, different investment consultants, um, different RIA firms. And just in this simple example from last year, you can see that in many asset classes, future expected returns are expected to go down again. 
So if we wrap that together, plans having more near-term liquidity needs as they age, as participants move to retirement mode, as their cash flow negative, combine that with the need to potentially have even more liquidity risk in their portfolio, how do we think about that? How do we think about a barbell strategy of marrying short-term liquidity needs with long-term investing? We think cash flow matching could be a tool in the toolbox to help plan sponsors address that. So with that, I'm going to stop, hand it over to Mike Rousset, who will take us through how we think about cash flow matching portfolios. Thanks, Mike. Uh, if we could turn to page 14 in the, in the slide deck. Um, one of the things that we've spent a reasonable amount of time thinking about is given this change in the way that plan sponsors are going to be thinking about their liquidity bucket and their um, their their illiquidity bucket or their illiquid bucket, uh, coming up ways to build out portfolios that create certainty of cash flows. So rather than having to uh, rely on selling down assets, as we all know, dealing with the March and April periods of just this this past this past quarter, um, it can be difficult at times to get liquidity even in asset classes that are assumed to be very liquid, such as public equities or um, or fixed income. And so, creating portfolios that allow the plan sponsor to be able to increase their illiquid risk, to be able to garner returns that are more consistent with what they need to achieve in order to meet their long-term uh, funding plans. Uh, brought us to the point of thinking through how do we build out cash flow matching portfolios. Now, certainly there are have been different versions of this over time. This isn't a, a brand new thought process, but rather than just using you know, your your capital uh, to be put into a stiff account or into a ladder treasury portfolio, we thought through utilizing the actual anticipated benefit payments that the sponsor needs to be invested against rather than a more traditional benchmark. And so this allows for a more bespoke, customized solution, which aims to uh, create those certainty of, of, of cash flows to meet those benefit payments. Um, the, the details of which we'll go through in a little bit more details uh, in a second, but uh, the, the point of this entire exercise is to build out a stable set of cash flows that are there to meet near-term or even long-term uh, anticipated benefit payments while allowing the rest of the asset allocation decisions to be driven towards that higher um, that higher allocation to, uh, to to more growth oriented assets. If you flip to page number 15, we flip through some of the different options that that plan sponsors can think about. Um, talk briefly about number one, and I'll get into more detail on that in a second. Some of the other things that have been done over time are as simple as just buy and hold credit, just owning uh, corporate bonds in a variety of different forms that have uh, different maturity profiles, different rating profiles, with the goal of creating a, a higher yielding portfolio and one that can be sold down as, as necessary. Um, there's certainly uh, some credit risk there, um, but again, to compare that to the cash flow matching strategy, you're not necessarily creating uh, uh, the, the liquidity to be an occurring at the exact same time when the plan sponsor needs to get that, that payment made. You compare that with some of the lower yielding strategies in options three and four, where you start to think about more traditional um, uh, cash balance is held at your custodian bank where it's relatively risk-free, but very, particularly in today's environment, very low yielding uh, and doesn't create much in the way of interest rate or duration sensitivity, um, which option four gives you a bit more of, but is also a pretty low yielding portfolio, uh, given that you're just really buying treasuries that are laddered out the, uh, laddered out the curve. So if we think about option one as being something that allows you to get some certainty of cash flows, that is a portfolio that's built given the customized objectives of each plan sponsor to, to create not only these cash flows, but do so in a manner that's consistent with the risk profile that each plan sponsor is looking to take, you start to think about um, ultimately building out, and if you look at, at page number uh, 16, how does this, how does this work? So ultimately what we're trying to do when we're building a cash flow matching portfolio is start with those cash flows. Um, the goal here is clearly to get a return that's consistent with the risk profile, uh, but also to minimize default or downgrade risk in the portfolio. 
we're not trying to build a portfolio that's concentrated in just high yielding or low yielding assets. We're trying to build a diversified portfolio, but not one that's necessarily built around a, a traditional benchmark, but instead is built around those cash flows that the plan sponsor is obligated to their, to their beneficiaries for. Ultimately, we optimize those, uh, those cash flows uh, against a universe of corporate bonds that we think uh, fit into those category of minimal downgrade risk and minimal default risk and have uh, a return profile that's consistent with the specific objectives of each plan sponsor and then build out a portfolio that we monitor on a regular basis to, uh, to, to, to minimize down downgrade risk and, and to ensure that the profile remains consistent with the original objective of the portfolio. This is moderate turnover. Um, it's, we can look at existing credit assets as a way to, uh, to look at minimizing some transaction costs, but the ultimate objective here is not necessarily to have a to an excess return relative to a benchmark but more so to build a portfolio that is built around the beta of the plan sponsor's liability. We still want to do this in a risk framework. We don't want to be running large risks here. We want to be um, focused on that certainty of cash flows. And so we do continue to think about collateral management, cash, interest rate hedging. If it's a global portfolio, think about the currency hedging. And it really becomes important to have that communication between the credit research team and the portfolio managers uh, to make sure that the overall objective remains in line with what the client is looking for. So if we kind of pull this all together, um, the, the overall objective here can be to meet the first three years of cash flows or meet the first three or five years of cash flows. We have some plan sponsors that look even longer and, and look to meet, match cash flow uh, payments that are due over the next 10 years or, or even longer. The, the idea of this whole um, the, this whole process is that it's customized to each specific plan sponsor's objective rather than it being built relative to a market-based um, traditional benchmark. And if you flip to page 17, please, uh, this some examples of some common constraints that we've utilized over time. Uh, um, you can you can kind of see that they're they're built to the specifics of what each portfolio was designed to do, and that, again, that they can be customized to mitigate risks that, that a plan sponsor is looking to mitigate whilst keeping in line with that cash flow matching or the cash flow driven uh, investment objective. So some of the things that you can kind of see laid out here would include ratings, limitations, average quality, um, and limiting some of the maturities around uh, different quality or sector uh, and industry weight. Uh, but all of this is built specific to each plan sponsor's respective objectives. So with that, um, I thought we'd See if there's any questions that we can, Mike or I can can go through. Great, thank you both. Um, so, have you seen any plans in the U.S. adopt cash flow matching strategies? Uh, good question, Hank. We have not really seen very much in the way of uh, U, uh, adoption in the U.S. Um, there has been some discussions around building out these types of portfolios as a as a way to as Mike uh, noted in his presentation, to be able to increase some of the less liquid uh, asset classes and, and, uh, and then, but still be able to remain the, the confident that you have capital to make your benefit payments. But we have not really seen many plans move in that direction. We have, however, seen in the UK market, this become a very popular way to address the concerns that, that, that we've referenced here. Um, and so that is something that we've, uh, we've, we've spent time on and we do manage in the, uh, in the UK market. And if I could just, just add as well, I think to Mike's point, we haven't necessarily seen plans adopt cash flow matching. What we have seen are plans start to build up their liquidity buckets, recognizing that their outflows are going to be increasing, right? This is not just a situation for 2019, 2020, but as we look out at the actuarial projections of outflows, um, it, it becomes pretty clear that this is just going to continue. And so we see plans building up liquidity. And then I think from our perspective, the question becomes, well, then what's the right mousetrap? What's the right way to approach this? And, and Mike, you say, walk through a couple of things that some plans do, whether it be just using cash from, you know, that they keep in a, in a stip to fund benefit payments. Sometimes we've certainly seen plans 
um, you know, think about other ways to kind of manage that liquidity pool. And what we're here today to say is, well, we think this is actually maybe something that plans should think about if they're starting to build up more liquidity as a way to potentially get a little bit more yield and what will likely be a, a low yield environment. And so, Mike Moran, just uh, jumping on that point, um, you know, how does interest rate impact uh, the strategy? So I'll make a couple of comments, and then I think Mike Busey will probably make some as well. But I think there's two ways to think about this. One is as we build up liquidity and as the return on just short-term investments goes down, can we get some sort of incremental return on a part of our portfolio that may be larger going forward than it has been in the past? That's one way to kind of enhance returns. But the other part of it comes back to what we talked about earlier, that just returns across a wide variety of asset classes are coming down. And so if returns are coming down in public equities, public fixed income, then we may have to think even more about returns for illiquid asset classes. And as we've outlined, and as I'm sure everyone on this call knows and appreciates, we've seen many public plans increase allocations to private equity, real estate, infrastructure, and given a low return environment going forward, they may have to think about increasing them even more, but that's again the tension between, if I'm gonna increase allocations to more illiquid asset classes, then maybe at the same time, I need to increase allocations to more of my liquidity bucket to make sure for the next couple of years, I have those benefit payments locked down. I don't have to worry about being a forced seller in an environment like we saw quite honestly in the first quarter of this year. Yeah, I think I think the other way to think about this is that yes, interest rates have fallen. Expected return on that on the fixed income asset class has fallen to reflect that. But more and more of the expected return going forward is going to be driven by credit assets and fixed income. And so as you start to think about the increasing allocation to corporate bonds, it does come with different risks than, say, owning a cash pool at your custodian or having a ladder treasury portfolio. You do have to think about downgrade risk, default risk, concentration risks. And so you start to move away from perhaps the objective of this liquidity bucket uh, as you go into one of those other other options that I that that I had laid out earlier. So building out the cash flow matching portfolio gives you that extra return profile that a corporate bond provides, but it does so in a manner that's consistent with what your anticipated payments are going to be over some period of time. So gets you a little boost to return because we do know that more of the fixed income return going forward will be driven by credit spreads and credit carry than it will be by interest rates, just given the levels of each. Um, and, but you still want to make sure that you're building out a portfolio that has a profile that's consistent with what ultimately you're trying to achieve here, which is something to pay your benefit payments. So last question. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, certainly in the U.S. and I guess in particular, our audience group of public plans really haven't adopted this yet. Uh, what do you think is the hurdle? And as public plans consider it, um, what are the things that they should be checking off or, or looking to as they look to implement this strategy? Uh, I'll, I'll throw some comments out, Mike, and then please chime in. Uh, I certainly think that it's really important to understand the credit markets, to understand the fixed income markets more broadly. Um, we are going to be entering into an environment where default risk and downgrade risk will continue to grow. And so having the depth of credit resources, both from an analyst uh, and, as well as a trading perspective, really is important to any mandate, not just this one, but any fixed income mandate as we will go through this round of, of, of potential defaults and downgrades. Um, the other part of this that really is, is vital is understanding ultimately those cash flows. It's, it is not an off-the-shelf benchmark that we're looking to manage to. We need to be able to understand those cash flows, model those cash flows, have systems to be able to handle it, and then be able to report it back to the client. So the plan sponsor can understand not just what they own for the purposes of, uh, of, of meeting these benefit payments, but also have a good sense of the risk profile uh, versus their liability itself. And so um, having not only that credit research cap and the, the, the broad credit capabilities is, is vital to being successful in these types of mandates, but also as, they, as plan sponsors look at it, it becomes really important to have those 
depth of resources around actuaries, systems to be able to handle these kinds of bespoke customized mandates. So I'll just add two things in terms of like, you know, as you point out, and as we discussed, maybe plans aren't doing it today. What do they have to think about? Maybe if they're going to do it going forward. I mean, I think part of it is number one, changing behavior. So a lot of it comes back to how did I fund benefit payments in the past? A lot of times it was, well, whatever the contributions come in, we just keep them over here for a few days and then we send them out the door for, for benefit payments. Or to the discussion we had earlier, maybe we just, you know, sweep money to a, a stiff fund at our custodian and we just draw that down. So now though, as it becomes a larger and larger issue for some plans, it comes to, well, maybe we have to do something different and getting plans to sometimes, or any or anybody or any individual to change behavior, just this is something different than what we've done in the past, can sometimes be difficult. And that comes almost to the, the question of governance and how do you affect a change in strategy. So I think that's one hurdle that some plan sponsors have to get over is this would be a change in behavior. How do we actually you know, put that into our portfolio? How do we get our governance model to sign off on it? Because then the second challenge I think comes to the, the area of communication. How do we communicate this to our board? How do we communicate to our other stakeholders that this is the strategy we wanna do in terms of potentially building up a liquidity pool for a number of months or maybe even a number of years of benefit payments and how to think about that from a governance perspective, from a benchmarking perspective that Mike talked about and how do we communicate success with the program or failure of the program? How do we evaluate it? So whenever you have a change in the way something's done, it just leads to a lot of governance questions, a lot of communication issues. But again, ultimately we're gonna say if this has becomes a, a bigger issue for a number of plans, then maybe now's the time to actually think about effectuating that change. Great, thanks, thanks, Mike Moran. Uh, Mike uh, Goose, Mike Moran, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation, and to our to our audience, thank you for joining us today. Uh, tune in on Thursday for our next webinar entitled "Understanding Shareholder Loss Estimates in Non-U.S. Securities Litigation." Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.